Well, hey, um, we are glad that you're here with us this morning, and whether you are here in the room, out on the patio, whether you're joining us online, we're glad that you have taken time to be with us this morning and to celebrate this King of Kings and Lord of Lords together. We're in week three of a series that we've just called Foundation, where we're working together to build a faith that can't be shaken, because the world continues to shake, right? I mean... Man, I hope you're still praying for the people over in in Turkey and in Syria because our our world continues to shake, whether it be physically, politically, economically, whatever. Our world just keeps shaking, doesn't it? And, And just when you think you've got solid ground to stand on, something else happens and everything just shakes. And we want to build a faith that can withstand all of the craziness of this world. A, a, a faith that can stand up against all of the, the stuff that happens in the world and a faith that can help us to have, uh, to have life abundant. And so we, we've started into this series. In the first week, we looked at the importance of building a strong foundation, just like you would in a house. A, a foundation that, that will last, that won't crash and burn. We also looked at, at who God is. And, and we discovered that he is eternal, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he's a creator, and because he's a creator, he's the definer of all things, he's the sustainer of life. And, and we looked at how God created everything that there is, and he saw that it was good. And then he created you and me, he created mankind, and he said, this is very good. But then last week, we looked at how just a couple chapters into the whole story, how mankind decided that we were gonna take what God created as good and that we were gonna turn it upside down. That we were gonna break all the good things that God had given to us. And and that, that, um, that we would, just like Adam and Eve and just like the serpent, that, that we, we would all of a sudden fall to the, to, to temptation. And that that would bring shame and blame and sickness and even death. Last week, we, we ended the service last week pondering how we, just like Adam and Eve, and even the devil before them, long to play this, we long to play the starring role in the drama of our lives. And we relegate God to the supporting actor role. And so I promised you last week that we would pick it up where we left off because there's really good news. There's really good news. And so I want to I pick it up where we left off last week. And it says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And, and pay close attention to this. It says, as for you, okay, and that's, that's all of us. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. I mean, that's where we ended things last week, and that that doesn't sound like a great story. But I told you there was a big but coming, right? In the next verse, in verse 4, it says this, but... Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, because it is by grace you have been saved. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Folks, this is the good news. The good news is that while we were deserving of wrath, while we were deserving of death, that through Jesus our sins can be forgiven. And our relationship with God can be restored. You know, I'm getting ready in, in just a couple of weeks to head uh, to Cambodia. It's the first time we've been able to go in a while. And one of the great things that I remember about one of the first trips I ever got to go to Cambodia, because in Cambodia it's, it's predominantly uh, Buddhist uh, in terms of religion, and then it's kind of a mishmash from there. Who was talking to one of the pastors who used to be and, and the Cameroon army and just, you know, crazy stuff that went on in that world. And we were talking to him about his faith. 
And he said, you know, when it came down to it, he said, he says, you know, I tried everything. He says, but what I discovered is only Jesus could take away my sin. Only Jesus could take away my sin. And folks, that's the good news. The good news is that our sins can be forgiven and that we can cross from death to life. The Christian life is all about following Jesus. If you've been a believer for any length of time, if you've been here for any length of time, you hear us all the time talking about like our desires to follow Jesus. We want to be followers of Jesus Christ. And I mean, because like we started in week one, whoever hears Jesus' words puts them into practice. He's like a wise person who builds a solid foundation and their house can stand. But if we hear Jesus' words and we don't follow, if we don't do what Jesus says, then we're like a foolish person who, who builds their house on a shaky foundation. But even before we get to the point where we can follow Jesus, we need to make sure that we're following the real Jesus. Right? I, I mean, the, the right understanding of Jesus is one of the most foundational pieces of our faith. If you have the wrong Jesus, you will have a worthless faith. In fact, it might even be more dangerous because it will lead you to places you don't want to go. Only the real Jesus can save you. Now, I love this old illustration about a guy who, um, he was looking for a job, kept going to the, you know, back when we had newspapers, you know, the want ads, uh, every day, the help wanted section. And one day he saw in there that, um, that the, the zoo was looking for some help. So he shows up at the zoo and they said, yeah, yeah, we need some help because one of our, uh, one of our gorillas is down sick and, um, and, and uh, we don't have a gorilla in our exhibit. And he said, so what we need you to do is we need you to put on this gorilla suit. And, and you can just go hang out in the, in the gorilla exhibit and, you know, there's all kinds of things in there. And they says, we just, we just need a gorilla in the, in the exhibit. So we just put on the suit and just go. And so he's like, well, that doesn't sound too hard. So he puts on the gorilla suit. And he just would go and he would sit out there. And, you know, the people would walk by. And, uh, and they would kind of point and they would move on. Well, he started to get bored. So he started to look around and see what was there. And he saw, like, there was, like, a tire hanging from a tree. And so he, would, he, he jumps up on the tire and he starts swinging and he noticed that when he did that, all the people would stop and they would watch him, right? And so he was like, oh, this is kind of fun. All the people are like watching and the people would point and the people, and then he'd swing higher and higher and the people would start going, ooh, ah, oh, look, look, you know, check out the gorilla. And the gorilla, and so, you know, the next day he thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do more of that. And so he comes back and he jumps on the tire and he's swinging like crazy and he's swinging and he's going even higher and the crowds were getting bigger. And so he's like, he's swinging on this thing, he's swinging on this thing. And then he starts going, okay, now I'm going to try to do some tricks, right? So he starts holding on with one hand, you know, standing on the tire, and he's swinging, swinging. Well, he's swinging super, super high, and one day he swings over, and he loses his balance. He lets go, and he flies over the wall into the next exhibit, which was the lion exhibit. And all of a sudden, this lion sees him and starts running in his direction, and all the people are running over going, what's going to happen? And then the, the lion comes running over. And, the, and, and so the gorilla, all of a sudden, he starts screaming, help, help, help. And when he started to scream help, the lion jumped and pounced on him. And out of the lion came this voice that said, shut up or we're both going to get fired. You see, the reality is, is that there's some things out there that might look right. There's some things that might be entertaining. There's some things that might grab your attention. But in the end, they're really not the real deal. And that, that really comes into play with what people believe about Jesus. Because there's a lot of false Christs that are out there. There's a lot of people saying a lot of crazy stuff 
about who Jesus is. And if we don't get the right Jesus, then we're lost. And, and so there, there's a lot of faulty views, like I said, out there about Jesus today. And, and one of them that I heard this week I wanted to share with you because I think it, it really shows where things are at in our society. So um, uh, one, one, an individual who's pretty popular today, um, a guy named Elon Musk, who most of you probably heard about, um, he, he was talking to a couple guys, and they asked him what he thought about Jesus, and um, this was his answer. I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated, um, and th- that the you know there's some some there's great wisdom in what in, in the te- teachings of, of Jesus, uh, and I agree with those teachings. Um, and things like turn the other cheek are are very important because as opposed to an eye for an eye. Um, an eye for an eye leads everyone blind. So forgiveness, you know, is important and um, treating people as you would wish to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Very important. So that's like a 60-70% as, yes? <laughs> as Einstein would say, I believe in the God of Spinoza. Um, so, um, but hey, if, um, you know, if, if, if Jesus is, is, uh, saving people, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't stand in his way, you know, like, I'll be sure, I'll be saved, why not? Sweet, we did it. Yeah. I think he just said yes. We got him. <laughs> All right. We got him. <laughs> yes. We got him. Sounds good. So. I, I know for a lot of us that have been in church for a long time, that, that looks like, you know, you can kind of have a little chuckle about the fact that the, the scariest thing is I, I'm thinking, okay, these guys, they think they just saved Elon Musk, right? Um, but, but this is a real picture of where a lot of people are in our, in our culture today, is they like, they like Jesus. They like the idea of Jesus, they, they like the wisdom of his teaching. They, they, they like the things that he says. Um, you know, they like love thy neighbor, right? That sounds really good. Um, they, they love things, you know, like, hey, forgiveness and all those things. A lot of people like that stuff. But man, I just, as I saw that, I just, I just said, man, I got to start praying for this guy because he, he's quite an influencer in our world. I thought, I just got to pray for this guy because the saddest part is, is that not only do these other guys that were with him, but, but you know, he's like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I've always wanted to get saved. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll add that to my list. Because I don't know if you caught it, he, he says, you know, like Einstein, I believe in this God of Spinoza, who's a, who's a you know, medieval philosopher kind of guy, um, who, who just thought God is in everything and kind of all these, you know, different kinds of things. But this is where our world is. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, our world has a lot of faulty views about who Jesus is. And, and we need to clarify who Jesus is. So this morning, we want to take a, a, a look at the real Jesus and who the real Jesus is. And one of my favorite passages of Scripture that just talks about who Jesus is is found in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 15 to 19. Um, And actually, I'm going to read through, I think, verse 22. And it says this. The Son. Okay, this is Jesus. He's the the Son. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things that we cannot see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities. In the unseen world, everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, the supreme over all who raised from the dead, and he is the first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. 
He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by our evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, as he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Man, there's a lot of good stuff in that thing. But the first thing that that we find is this. Jesus, if you want to know the real Jesus, is Jesus is God. We've talked about that a lot before. When we were in our study in John, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made made. Colossians uh, 1, 16, 17, the verse we just read, it says, everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Little words are important. I mean, it says, everything was created through him. Do, do you remember, how, a couple weeks ago when we talked about God, do you remember, how did God create everything? How did God create the heavens and the earth. What, what, what did he do to create it? He spoke it. So what do you use when you speak? The word. Who is the word? Yeah, Jesus, right? And, and John says, in the beginning was the word. So when Jesus spoke, right, so everything was created through him. Jesus was with God in the beginning creating everything. So Jesus didn't just show up at Christmas. You know, it, it wasn't like, you know, God was writing the story, things went bad, and he's all, oh my gosh, I gotta send somebody, I need to get a Jesus, and send him down there, right? No, it, Jesus was there from the beginning. It's, it's, we'll talk more about this in a couple of weeks, but this whole idea of the triune God, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together, which, let's just get this straight. We don't fully understand how that works. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right? There's parts of that that we're, that, you know, if you just think about it all the time, you know, your mind will just melt. But it's something that we believe by faith because God's word says that it's true. So everything was created through him. And then here's the other thing everything was created for him. I mean, for him. And we're going to jump back to that in just a minute. Well, actually, look, so everything's created for him. And if everything that's created for him, were were you created? So you are created for him. See, one of the biggest issues that we have in our culture today is everybody, everybody wants to, like, write their own story. We hear about that all the time, right? Right? You gotta write this story, you know, it's it's your journey, it's your story, it's your thing. It sounds really nice, but here's the reality. You are created for him. And if you don't let him be the one who guides your story or guides the journey of your life or who brings you from death to life, then you're just lost in a story of your own design. And that's what happens, and people are wandering trying to write their own story. And I, I want to tell you this this morning. Jesus has a story for you. And it's better than the one that you can write. You were created for him and for his glory because he's God. And he existed before anything and he holds all creation together. That's pretty important. Because what if he stopped holding it all together today? I mean, you think, you think we can make a mess of things? What, what if he decided to just like, you know, I'm tired of holding it all together. I'm, I'm tired of holding the universe together. Right? When you think about creation and all the ways that this happened, I mean, this, I love this. The, the earth, okay, the earth, this, this kind of globe that we live on, right? It's spinning on its axis, at about a thousand miles an hour, right? Anybody feel it? That's pretty bizarre. I I mean, if I put you in a car and drove a thousand miles an hour, or I guess a plane, right? You would feel it. 
but we're all like spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And yet God's worked it all out so that none of us fly off. So, and here's the other, here's, here's even better. Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour, and while it's spinning, we're orbiting the sun, okay? It's spinning and we're orbiting the sun, and so we're spinning a thousand miles an hour, and then we're orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. It's like the Disney teacups on crack. <laughs> right? Anybody feeling sick, like from the spinning? You know, my poor wife every once in a while will get a little vertigo thing, right? She's, uh, I'm like, well, maybe it's the earth, right? Because like, it's doing this, and it's doing this, and it's just like it's going. It's just going like crazy. And then the sun is like 92 million miles away. 92 million miles away. Thank goodness. Right? It's 1.3 million times the mass of Earth. So you could fit 1.3 million Earths in the size of the sun. And it burns at 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Right? Nothing will ever make it to the sun. Right? Because it will melt long before it gets there. But what's amazing is, is when there's all this spinning and stuff going on, is still in the midst of all of that, we are at the perfect distance away from the sun. Because if we were just slightly closer, we would all burn up. And if we were just slightly further away, we would all freeze. And some people think that that whole balance just happens by chance. The fact that God is holding everything together is pretty amazing and pretty awesome. But something that we just go in day in and day out and we don't really give it much thought. But he is holding all creation together. That deserves some worship and praise, amen? And then Colossians 2, 9 says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in, human, in, in the human body, right? So it's all the fullness of God in, in human form. All the fullness of God. Now, again, this is something that's absolutely miraculous. The incarnation or God becoming flesh is an absolute miraculous thing that we can't fully comprehend. But the Bible tells us that it's true. You know, John the Apostle um, who was probably uh, one of the people who was closest to Jesus when he was living on earth, right? I mean, John was the one who was, he was one of the only disciples that we know of that made it to the cross and was standing there and Jesus said, hey, John, like, take care of my mom, right? And, and so John and he were close. John was part of Jesus' inner circle of just, you know, guys that would go with Jesus everywhere, who got to see things that not everybody else got to see and just, you know, hung out with Jesus all the time. Right? These guys were super close friends. But John is also the one, the only one that we know of that at this point that's gotten to see the resurrected Jesus in all of his glory. Because listen to what John saw when he saw Jesus and, and who Jesus is right now. In Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 12, okay, this is, these are the words of the apostle John and he said this. John says, when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long ro robe and a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were like white wool and as, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in the furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty oceans. And he held seven stars in his right hand. And he had a, t a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I ran up to him and I hugged him and said, but I missed you. Is that what happened? No. It says, when I saw him, I said, hey, Jesus, you're my homeboy. Right? Have you, anybody seen that t-shirt? 
Yeah, that's not what happened. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. You know, Jesus is awesome in power. He is the risen Savior. And does he want to be a friend? Yes, but I think we need to be careful with that because he's probably not just our homeboy. When you see Jesus face to face, like John, I mean, John got to spend time with this guy and he's still like, he fell to the ground as if he was dead. That is how much glory and power Jesus has. You know, some people claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. But over and over again in Scripture, he says, I am, right, using the name for God. In fact, that's why they wanted to kill him. The, the religious leaders, there's one day when Jesus was out and he's performing miracles and he's doing stuff, and, and the religious leaders, they want to kill him, okay? Why? And they said, because you blaspheme, because you make yourself equal to God. They got it. They just didn't like it. And there's still people in the world that don't like it. But Jesus is truly God. But he's not only truly God, he is fully human. Fully human. And this is the part, it's hard for us to comprehend, but Jesus is fully God and he's fully human. In Colossians 1, 20 and 22, it says, And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And this includes you who were once far away from God, You were his enemy, separated from him by your evil uh, thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. Back to the Gospel of John. John said in John 1.14, the word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. In 2 John, okay, it's only got one chapter. 2 John, verse 7, it says, um, where John says this, I say this to you because many deceivers have gone out into the world and they deny that Christ, that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. Hebrews 14, 14 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest that is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are and did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Here's the good news. The greatest news ever is that not only is Jesus God, but Jesus became human, and he lived, the, he lived life here on earth just like we did. And he understands, he understands us, right? I guess the thing today is he gets us, right? The, if you've seen the commercials, right? Jesus understands. And whatever you're going through, Jesus understands it. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be cold. He knows what it's like to be hurt. He knows what it's like to have pain. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to have nothing. He knows what it's like to have everything. Jesus understands. And that's one of the most amazing things. And he had to do that so that he could shed his blood on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. You know, and lastly, the the thing that we're gonna kind of end with this morning is this, Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. John 14, 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus is the way, he's the only way to salvation. And that doesn't play well in our world. You know, people today say, man, that just sounds so narrow-minded. Like that Jesus is the only way. It always has been. (laughs) It always has been perceived as narrow minded. You know, the Romans hated the Christians. One of the reasons that they hated them the most is because they refused to worship 
Jesus and all the other gods. They actually, at times, they were like, hey, yeah, we'll just make another statue of Jesus, add him to the rest of the gods. He can just be like one of the other ones, right? And people today still try to do that. They try to add Jesus to all the other religious stuff in their life. They, they kind of, it's kind of like a spiritual smorgasbord, right? They kind of walk in, they're like, okay, I'll take a little of this and a little of this, and oh, I like that. That, that, that sounds really good, you know? And, and, that's, and people are mishmashing this faith together. But here's the thing. Jesus is the only way. He, he didn't leave himself open to like, oh, you, you just believe in me and then you can pick whatever else you want. No, he's the only way to salvation. Acts 4.12 says this, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by, to mankind by which we must be saved. By the way that we must be saved is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way and he's also the truth. Um, He he defines what truth is. There's uh, the big thing in our world today is, you know, like, um, hey, you, you, you do your truth, right? You can have your truth. Just let me have my truth. And we've talked about this before. There's, there's, there's this huge problem with that is what happens when my truth bumps into your truth, Right? Jesus alone is truth. I love it in John chapter 18 when, when Jesus stands before Pilate, right, just before he's crucified. And he's standing before Pilate, and Pilate looks at him and he says, so you're a king then, right? And Jesus answers Pilate and he says, well, you say I'm a king, but then Jesus cha- he says, in fact, Jesus says, the reason I was born and came into this world to te- is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus has the truth. He is the truth. Jesus doesn't just teach truth. He is truth. And so whatever Jesus says is true. The problem is, is there are a lot of people running around the world and they, they like to believe what they want to believe and then they go try to find something to prove their truth. Right? They they go, they find the truth that they want, and then they try to then they judge Jesus' words on the basis of what they think, what they feel, what they've experienced. They're like, oh, that's true, you know, my experience, my feelings, my emotions, my thoughts, what I heard on the news, what I saw on Google. People are like that, you know, you like pick what you want to believe, and then you go try to like prove that that's the fact. Jesus says, no, it's not how this works. Jesus says, you trust me. I am the truth. And I will help you weigh everything else and determine whether or not that stuff is right or wrong. I I hear it all the time. There's a lot of people that are like, you know what? I like Jesus except for this. I like Jesus except when he says this, right? Right? Except when Jesus says, I can't do what I want to do. But Jesus is the truth, and he can't be anything else. You know, when Jesus was walking with his disciples, one day he said, um, in, in Matthew chapter 16, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and so others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, right? In fact, what, what, what they were saying is, oh, you're a good religious figure, right? I mean, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And you know, there's still people saying the same thing about Jesus today. There's a lot of opinions and a lot of other ideas about who Jesus is, and a lot of the other religions of the world teach a lot of different things about who Jesus is. You know, the, um, the, the Mormon church, right? Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, in Mormonism, Jesus is a creation. He's a product of a relationship between a god and his goddess wife who were people from another planet at one time. And he's a brother of Lucifer. Right? 
So that so that that's a Jesus that's out there. But he's a Jesus in a gorilla outfit, right? <laughs> so to speak. It's it, that's that's not the Jesus that the Bible teaches. You know, and I, again, I'm not I'm not saying this to offend somebody. I'm saying this because I want people to know the truth. We, 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 you know, it's like, it's okay. Don't get mad at people when they don't have it right. Help them find the truth. And who is the truth? Yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses, they deny the deity of Christ. They believe he was just another human. Um, in Islam, they say that Jesus was a great prophet. They, they believe in Jesus and, and, and his teaching, but they just say he was a great prophet, just like one of many. Right, he was just in line, not quite as as great as Muhammad, but he was a great prophet. He was a great teacher, and a lot of people want to believe Jesus is a great teacher. But then other people have some pretty crazy ideas of, about Jesus. Um, Scientology, right? Um, Scientology. Uh, their their um, founder, L. Ron Hubbard, he said this about Jesus, which I think is really quite interesting. He says, "Christ never existed, but was only an idea." electronically implanted in our minds during the between lives period and we call this implant, he calls it R6. And he said, somebody on this planet, somewhere around 600 BC, found some pieces of this R6. But we don't know how they found it. But they, we think they were watch, uh, watching a madman or something. But since that time, they have used it and it became known as Christianity. And Christ died for his own sins, not yours and mine. Okay? Just, there, just, there's a lot of teaching out there about who Jesus is. But we have to worship the real Jesus. And, and, and we, you know, one of the greatest things that I, I heard this morning was, was chatting with Ireland right before she got baptized. And she said, I'm so excited today because this is my choice to follow Jesus. You know? Super glad the family's been bringing her and she's, you know, that stuff. But she's like, no, I, I, I know who Jesus is. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. You know, there's still a lot of people out there in the world, they believe a lot of stuff about Jesus. But on that same thing, when Jesus says, hey, who do people say that I am? The, the next line in Matthew 6, 15 says this. Jesus turns around and he looks at these disciples and says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? I think you just need to let those words sink in deep today. Who do you say Jesus is? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Who do you say Jesus is? I'm sure that many of you are aware of the, the, faith, the, the famous uh, trilemma given by apologists such as C.S. Lewis and Josh McDowell, and they basically say, hey, look, there's three options about who Jesus is. He was either a liar, the greatest deceiver that ever lived, or he was a crazy man who pulled the wool over everyone's eyes. He was a lunatic. He was, he was a demon-possessed guy, someone who was absolutely insane. He claimed to be God. So the question is, is he, or he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he is who he claimed to be. God himself in the flesh. And the question this morning is, the question is still the same, and Jesus asked you and I the same question that he asked his disciples so many years ago. Who do you say Jesus is? Who is he? Is he just kind of an add-on to your life? Is it, like we said last week, is he just a supporting actor in the role of your story? 
Or is he the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Because if he is who he says he is, then then he deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all of our obedience. He's not somebody who we just trifle with. He's not somebody who we kind of hang out with, you know, once a week, or, or we give a little bit of attention to here and there. If he is the one holding all the universe together, if he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, if he is the one who holds eternity in his hands, then folks, we better pay attention. And the question is, what are you going to do with that this morning? Jesus wants so desperately to have a relationship with you. And the Bible is filled with titles of Jesus. And, and I love, there's, a, there's an evangelist guy, his name's J. John, he's a pretty funny guy, he's from England, and, and I loved what he said about Jesus. He, he was going through the titles of Jesus, and here's what he said. He says, you know, the Bible says Jesus is the bread of life. He said, so that bakers could understand him. Jesus is the living water, so that plumbers could understand him. Jesus is the light of the world, so that the electricians could understand him. Jesus is a cheap cornerstone so that the architects can understand him. Jesus is the morning star so that the astronomers can understand. Jesus is the hidden treasure so that the bankers can understand. Jesus is a great physician so that the doctors and nurses can understand. He's a great teacher so the educators can understand. He's the lily of the valley so that the florists can understand. He's the rock of ages so that geologists can understand. He's the true vine so that the horticulturists can understand. He's the righteous one so that the judges can understand. He's a pearl of great price so that the jewelers can understand. He's the, he is wisdom so the philosophers can understand. He's the word so writers can understand him. He's the good shepherd so that the ranchers can get it. He's the Alpha and Omega so the scientists can know him. He's the King of Kings so that royalty can understand him. He's the resurrection so the morticians can understand. He's the mediator so lawyers can understand. He's the wonderful counselor so the psychologists can understand. He is the life so that the biologists can understand. He is the way so that the traffic stops, traffic cops can understand him. And he is the truth so that we hope that the politicians can understand him. But all that to be said, the question is, who do you say Jesus is? Because as Devin shared earlier, Philippians tells us that he's coming again. That Jesus is coming to take us with him, and it says, and when he does, it says, Every knee will bow. That's your knee and that's my knee. You know, ju- just like John, right? He-, he fell on the ground as if he was dead. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The, the question is, is, are you going to wait until you have to? Or will you do that now? Because one day, no matter where you stand on things, you will bow before him. And my prayer today is that we will do it now so that we can live the kind of life that he intended us to live and help others who have no view or a wrong view or a distorted view of Jesus that we can help bring them to Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you're here this morning and you're like, man, pastor, that, that, that is a lot. Uh, I know. In fact, it's more than that. It's everything. Because how you answer that one question, who do you say Jesus is? That question determines your eternity. And if you're here this morning and you haven't said, hey, yeah, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. If you're here this morning and, 
and you have never made that claim, if, if you've never said, yeah, I, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life, then, then today, I, my prayer is that you would make today that day. And if you're here this morning and, and you want to talk to somebody more about what that means, then I'm going to ask our, some of our, our elders here from the church uh, to come up and, and to be up here up front and you can come and chat with them. If some of you, you know, are confused about some of that and you just want more information, man, we, we want to talk to you. Um, but don't leave today with, with an undone, an unfinished view of who Jesus is. Because he loves you. And he wants to spend eternity with you. Who do you say Jesus is? You know, every week we celebrate what Jesus did for us. And this communion reminds us that, that Jesus did come and he did take on flesh. And so each week we take the, the bread that represents the body of Jesus Christ that he came to bring salvation, to die on the cross for you and for me so that we could have life. So let's take that bread together and celebrate his life. And the cup represents his shed blood that reminds us that Jesus' blood forgives our sins. He paid the price that we could not pay so that we could have freedom and forgiveness of sin. So let's take that together. And this morning, my prayer for each and every one of us. I know I threw a lot at you this morning, but I pray that you'll just wrestle that down and answer the question today. Who do you say Jesus is? We're here for you. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you. If you've got some other things that you'd like to pray about, you know, you can find somebody in one of the blue shirts or... We'd love to pray. You can head back to the areas in the back corners for prayer, but we would love to talk to you more because eternity hangs in the balance. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all of the glory and honor and praise. Father, we recognize you as God. But Father, we're so thankful that, Lord, you came. You came for us to give us eternal life. And we thank you, Father, that you didn't make this difficult, that, Father, we just need to come to you and acknowledge you for who you are. And that, Father, when we believe, you give us the gift of eternal life. We love you, Father. We praise you. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen.